All right, well, good morning, everyone. As always, very thankful to worship together and share God's word with you. If you're new or visiting, my name is Sam. I'm part of the pastoral staff. I want to welcome you to our church. And happy December. I'm not sure how it was for you, but this year flew by for me, and I can't believe it's already December. Uh, again, this is a season that marks what in traditionally in the Christian church begins a season of Advent, which literally translates anticipating or waiting. And for Christians, this is kind of a, a time in the year that's really marked off for us to consider what Christmas is really about to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, which is a historically transformative event for obviously all of the universe, but especially for people who profess to be Christians. And so we're going to do our best to not do a full-blown Advent thing, but to do things here and there to help us to prepare our hearts and be mindful of that leading up until Christmas. Again, we will still be doing lunch, even though we won't have our regularly planned uh, Lord's Supper. So look forward to engaging in fellowshipping. And just a reminder to all of us, that's a great opportunity to not just eat with our friends or those who we know, but like just to meet someone new as we constantly have new people who are checking out our church and or even members who we haven't been able to connect with in a while. So look forward to uh, seeing you there in the cafeteria. Uh, If you're joining us for the first time, we just started a a new five-week sermon series through the book of Malachi. Uh, Hopefully, you were able to join last week. Uh, But if you weren't, last week, I basically shared how Malachi is not just this random book we're going through, but it's especially appropriate for the Advent season because, to give a little reminder, it is the last book of the Old Testament, which means it is the last recorded interaction that God has with his people before the first Christmas, a.k.a. when Jesus first enters the world uh, by virtue of his birth. So Malachi, God speaks to his people, interacts with them, and then Christmas happens. And so, in a way, Malachi, it's actually an appropriate book every year as we head into the Advent season to see what was God's final word to his people and even to us today in light of the coming of Christ. And just to recap, uh, if you weren't able to join, last week we saw that God essentially has a conversation with his people in the book of Malachi. It's unlike any other prophet, unlike any other book in the Bible. God literally speaks the majority of the book in first person, talking to his people, opening up his heart, engaging with them. And what we learned last week was the driving question that begins the conversation is this question of, does God love us? Right? And God fully begins the conversation grounding everything that he's about to say in the book, not in any sort of command or any sort of to-do list, but more importantly, he grounds it in the fact that he has loved his people, right? We took a long time digging into this idea that God has loved them. He will love them. He will forever love them because his love is like any, not unlike anything in this world. It is covenantal. It is unconditional. And we went d- deep into that. So I encourage you, if you don't know what that I'm talking about, to listen to that. But for the rest of the book, now that the, the foundation has been laid, that everything God is saying is out of love, God rightfully flips that question around now. And the question that will drive the rest of the conversation he has and the rest of the book is not, how has God loved us? a.k.a. his people, but God now looks at his people and says, okay, I've told you I've loved you and I've told you how. Now, how have you loved me? Totally flare question. I've done my part. I've kept the covenant. I have loved you, but how have you loved me? And in light of that, we'll see how God begins this conversation. So if you have your Bibles or your programs, turn with to Malachi chapter 1. We'll read from verse 6 to 14. And as we open God's word, can we all rise together as here at our church we believe every time we open God's word, God is present and he is speaking through his spirit powerfully through his word. So Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, God begins the conversation and interacts with his people. Verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me, says the Lord of armies to the priests who despise my name? Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you, you ask, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible? When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor as the Lord of armies? And now plead for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favor as the Lord of armies? I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Verse 11. 
My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it when you say, the Lord's table is defiled and its product, its food is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands, asked the Lord? The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow, but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. The reading of God's word. Let me pray for us. Father, at this time, I pray that our hearts, our ears would be undivided towards you, that your spirit would speak powerfully and in a relevant way to our church, and that it would be something that we would deeply consider as your word is authoritative over our lives. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. What a text, right? What a text. Oh man, I've been sitting in this text pretty much for quite some time now, and it is, the more I sit in it, the more it's like, oh man, God has some stuff to say. And all of us knows that whenever you are in a relationship, particularly a close relationship, it is never fun or easy to bring up uh, issues or address conflict, right? That's why for a lot of us, we are conflict avoiders. We just choose not to deal with it. Uh, And so what we'll do is instead of dealing with whatever's causing a, a rift in our relationship, be it with a friend, be it with a roommate, be it with a spouse or even a parent, naturally what you do is you just ignore it, right? You'll distance yourself. I've heard people literally say, I don't want to deal with this person, so I'll just kind of slowly uh, minimize them in my life or cut them out of my life. I don't want to deal with it. But we also know if you really care about someone and if you really care about the relationship and you want to preserve intimacy, you're going to have to address and deal with the tension point in the relationship, right? Healthy marriages are not ones that don't have conflict. They're the ones that have conflict all the time. And they learn how to deal with it. They learn how to talk about it to preserve intimacy. Now, have you ever been in a situation, and I'm sure many of us have, where you have thought long and hard about, how am I going to bring this up in this close relationship that I have about this thing that has been bothering me in our relationship? Either it's something the person has said or something the person has been doing in a regular enough manner where it's like, I feel like I can't really be in an intimate relationship unless I bring this up. So you finally muster up the courage, you, you create the conversation, you bring it up to the person, and the person responds not with curiosity, which is like, oh, tell me more, I didn't didn't know about that, or even remorse of, oh my goodness, I did not know that was going on. But instead, have you ever had someone respond with a, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't do that. What are you talking about? Married couples, we've either received that or we've given that so many times, have we not? Remember, God has laid the foundation of his conversation with his people in the context of his covenant love. So covenant is essentially the similar thing as a husband and a wife. And oftentimes in scripture, that's how God describes it. God is the husband. His people are the spouse. So as a husband would approach his wife, God in covenant love raises a concern with his people. And the main thing that God brings up and takes issue with is how his people Israel have been approaching and practicing their worship of him. Look at verse 6. He kicks it off very clearly. A son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I'm a father, where's my honor? If I'm a master, where's your fear of me, says the Lord of armies to the priests who despise my name. God is not unclear here. He's very direct with what his issue is. He's saying, on a human level, okay, sons naturally show honor to their father. Now, unfortunately, we live in the modern West where honoring anyone, respecting anyone, showing, uh, you know, some degree of uh, honor to anyone that is authoritative is kind of disappearing now. Right? I grew up in a day and age where if you ask me what the name of my third grade teacher was, I'll tell you it's Mr. Johnson. Because we never called him by his first name. I, st- I don't know his first name to this day. Right? Teachers this day, I commend you. I don't know how hard it is to teach now because there's zero respect. I keep hearing from my teacher friends, like kids these days, they don't respect authority. They don't show any honor. They could care less. Right? They're the type that when they come up to you, they would come up to me and say, not Mr. Bay. They would say, what's up, Sam? Right? That's just kind of the, the area we live now. Right? But back then, sons would show honor to their father. It's more akin to maybe old America where you don't say, hey, dad. You say, sir. And so he's saying, Sons show honor to their father. I'm a father. Where's my honor? 
And he's saying, servants and slaves, slavery was very common back then. They honored their master and feared them. And to use a, maybe a more relatable term, because there's no slavery today, he's saying, you, you, you re- respect and fear your CEO, right, and your work boss or your manager, and I'm your master. How come you don't fear me? Very understandable thing that God is saying. He's saying, you treat these people with honor and respect, and rightfully so, and yet you don't treat me with that same honor and respect. You treat me so lightly. That's what he's saying. And let's see how the people respond. Not with curiosity, not with remorse, but they say, yet you ask, how have we despised your name? They're essentially saying, what do you mean? They're getting defensive. We honor you, God. What are you talking about? We're good followers of Yahweh. You see, whether it's back then or today, one thing that the God of Scripture deserves and calls his people to is to worship him wholeheartedly. Amen? That's very, very clear. And if you're a Christian sitting here today, that should not even be in question. And he actually does not leave it up to us to determine what that worship looks like. Right? God doesn't arbitrarily say, I want my people to worship me. Now you figure out what that looks like. No, no, no. The entire Old Testament law is very, very clear exactly to the T what acceptable proper worship should entail. And God is very clear about that. And so the rest of the conversation, we're going to see God digs into this topic. And to organize our message, there's three main questions that we'll consider. One, why does God deserve our worship? Number two, what kind of worship is acceptable to God? And three, hopefully more practically, how then should we worship God rightly today? Okay? So first, why does God deserve our worship? Now, obviously, worship, it's such a broad term. We're probably all over the place in how we define it. So let me give a simple unifying definition. Worship derives from a word that literally means the idea of worth. Worthship, right? Worthiness. So simple understanding of what it means to worship is to give appropriate recognition and respect in a manner that matches the worthiness of that object or person. That's what worship is. So, for example, a silly illustration. If a puppy came up to you and you saw the puppy, what would you probably do? You'd probably go near it. If you're a dog person, you'd probably say, oh, how cute. You want to cuddle with it. You'd pat it on the head, and you think this is adorable. But imagine that same day, you go on a hike, you turn a corner, and you come face to face with a grizzly bear. Let me tell you, would you go up to it and say, oh, how cute, and pat it on the head? You can try. You may not live the next day. (laughs) Why? Because in that moment, you would probably start sweating, There'd be more of a a reverence and fear by virtue of what's in front of you. You'd probably take a couple steps back, and you would have appropriate awe and reverence for the fact that this grizzly bear has the power to end your life. That's not to say you're bowing down and worshiping it, but that's the idea that is caring. There is a manner and approach and posture when it comes to a grizzly bear that is appropriate to the worthiness of what this animal is. So let's break it down then. This should be the simplest question, but it is tragically forgotten in the life of Christians so often. So then why does God deserve our worship? It's a tragedy that God needs to even bring Malachi into the picture to defend his worth to his people. But that's what Malachi has to do on God's behalf in this text. So first, why does God deserve our worship? Look at the main repeating title that Malachi uses for God. I don't know if you caught it when we read the text. There's this thing that comes over and over and over again when it comes to God. And if you look carefully, it's this phrase or term, Lord of armies, or some translation call it Lord of hosts. In the nine verses we read, he uses that title eight times. Lord of armies, Lord of armies, Lord of armies. In the short book of Malachi, he uses that title 24 times. So clearly it's intentional. It's not random. He could have used any other title he wants, but why does he keep saying Lord of armies, Lord of armies? What does that title mean? And what does it have to do to point to God's worthiness? Well, to give you a simple definition of what it means, it's literally the Lord of armies. Hosts means a myriad or great number of armies or angels. The idea is that God has a host and myriad of angelic armies at his disposal. That's what Lord of Armies means. Now, let me paint a picture of what significance that carries. If you didn't know, obviously, there's a lot of things going on in the world right now. One of them is a war in the Middle East. There's a lot of tension. And obviously, if you didn't know, the U.S. is kind of somewhat involved. 
And a big deal, one of the biggest moves for the U.S. to get involved that was all over the headlines was the U.S. deployed the Gerald R. Ford aircraft carrier to the Middle East. Now, this was a big deal. It's not like there are not a lot of carriers in the world, but this one was unique because it's not just any carrier. It is the newest carrier built. It is also the world's largest carrier. It carries over 5,000 sailors on board. I nerded it out a little bit. Not only that, it has a nuclear reactor on board. It can carry 75 military aircrafts on this one carrier. There's fighter aircrafts with literally next-gen fighters like the F-18, the E-2 Hawkeye. In other words, this is the ultimate global flex of military force and power. And the U.S. is signaling, we're sending that over there. And you can go into even more detail about how powerful it is. But the reason it was sent over there, and I quote, is because it is meant to not engage in conflict, but to serve as a deterrent by bringing a significant amount of power to the region to basically say, be careful, because we have a lot of power in this vicinity. I share that because no matter what, people, whether you like it or not, they have to acknowledge and show appropriate respect to that level of power, or they're going to face the consequences. That's literally why it's there. That kind of power carries the weight that affects nations, and we're seeing that happening geopolitically. Now, Malachi, what he would say is if he comes today and he reads the headlines, he would say, In no hyperbolic fashion, God is the Lord of armies, and his power would make the Gerald R. Ford carrier seem like a toy battleship. Malachi is saying, our heavenly father is not a puppy. You don't cuddle and pat the Lord of armies on the head. He is a force and power to be reckoned with. In fact, Jesus himself always had this understanding of God. And the layers are peeled back in this famous story. If you don't know, the moments before Jesus is about to be betrayed and handed over, basically there's this fun story that we might have heard of. Basically, uh, the Roman soldiers come. They're about to take him away. And his, you know, gung-ho apostle Peter, he draws his little, like, dagger sword. He's like, I will protect you, Jesus, as if Jesus couldn't defend himself. He cuts off the soldier's ear. And Jesus says something very interesting here. First, he says, chill out, Peter. Okay, he doesn't actually say that. I add those words in. And in Matthew 26, it's up there. Look at what Jesus says, talking about the sheer nature and power of God. Jesus told him, put your sword back into its place, because all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will provide me here and now with more than 12 legions of angels? In other words, Peter, you think I'm powerless right now? You think God is like so weak that he cannot save me from these puny Roman soldiers? Do you not know at the snap of a finger, God could send legions of angels that can wipe out the entire world 10 times over, like literally in this moment. Jesus always had that kind of power at his disposal by virtue of God being his father. So all that is to say the God of the Bible deserves rightfully to be feared and worshiped. Why? Because he's worthy of it. And God himself, he is super secure in this. He understands this. That's why he is jealous for his glory. Look at verse 11 and verse 14 in your text. What is God saying? He is asserting his worth, not in this prideful way, but in an objective manner. He's saying, my name will be great from the rising of the sun to its setting. In other words, all, even today, Sunday, if you didn't know, Sundays are unique days because for 24 hours by virtue of the globe spinning, God's name is being worshipped all day today around the world. Why? Because he's worthy of it. And he's saying, that's my name. It deserves that kind of greatness. And in verse 14, he doesn't say, I am a lowly servant in this moment. He doesn't say, I am your friend, even though he's these things. What does he say? He says, I am a great king. Today you come to worship a great king. That the nations should fear. That's what he's saying. Now, why this aspect of God? Why would this have been especially important for Israel and their context to be reminded of? Remind, remember their context. They have returned to their land, but it's not actually fully their land yet. They have no military power. They're still under the rule of a Persian foreign empire. They have no strength of their own. And in the midst of feeling that powerlessness, how assuring would it have been for Malachi to emphatically remind them, your heavenly father is the Lord of armies. You may feel like a puny nation, but look at history. The greatest empires of history have risen and fallen at my hand, and yet you guys are still here. I have preserved you because I have loved you, right? Jacob, I have loved. Now, here's a quick application. Is this the image that you have of God as you approach him in worship today? 
that if the spiritual realm was visible and the ceiling off this place was peeled back and the, the sky and the layer of heaven was peeled back, that in one sense what Malachi is saying is God is sitting on his throne, myriads and myriads and legions of angels at his command. Or is week after week the temptation for you to have the image of a domestic, insecure God who's always pestering you to, to love him back and to please give him some of your time. You see, for a lot of us, God is a friend. God is a counselor. Amen to that. He is not less than that. But today's text tells us he's much more. And if that's all he is, if he's just a friend and just a counselor, of course you will not feel the fear to honor him, to revere him. And that's exactly what the Israelites fell into, which leads to the second point. What kind of worship is acceptable to God? Now, in order to answer this, we've got to work backwards with the flow of the text because God's dealing with not acceptable worship, but more importantly, unacceptable worship, which was the kind that Israel was giving. So let me give some necessary context. The main arena that Israel offered their worship to God was through the temple. And the main way they did it through the temple was to offer up sacrifices to God, animal sacrifices. This is the way that God designed it. This is the way that God ordained it. It's not something they just made up. God clearly put it into place, and he gave very specific instructions on this is what proper worship involves. This is what proper worship entails. And as we continue in our text, we'll see Israel had been careless. Does that describe our worship today? Careless. Departing from the way that God asks. So they ask God, God, how have we despised your name? And what does God say? God says, you present defiled food on my altar. In other words, God is saying, your your sacrifices are not acceptable according to what I have told you. Now, just to defend God here a little bit, that he was not unclear, okay? Let's briefly look at where this comes from. Leviticus 22. I know you don't do your devils through Leviticus. There's a whole section about this. I'm going to give you a snippet of what God's clear instructions were for what an acceptable offering is. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to Aaron, his sons, and all the Israelites, and tell them, any man of the house of Israel, of the resident aliens in Israel who presents his offering, verse 19, they must offer an unblemished male from the cattle, sheep, or goats, In order for you to be accepted, you are not to present anything that has a defect because it will not be accepted on your behalf. A sixth grader can read this and comprehend what God is saying. He's saying, essentially, if I can give you a nutshell, the implication is give the best of your animals because that is acceptable. Don't give the second tier because that is not acceptable. And he says that time, and he gets so specific in Leviticus. He says if, it's, if it has like a broken leg, don't bring it. If it is diseased, don't bring it. Almost like he leaves no room for question on what acceptable is. Seems pretty straightforward. That is the standard that God has laid out that every Israelite, especially the priests, should have known. And can I include you, please, therefore, by extension, pray for the leaders and pastors in general, but of this church. We have a higher accountability before the Lord to teach and to model correctly what it is. I feel that burden immensely. I felt it even more this past week. At the same time, even though he's addressing priests, the New Testament says we are all priests in Christ, so you're not off the hook. (laughs) This is to all of us. But at the same time, I I covet your prayers as someone who is commissioned essentially to rightly teach what God commands. So in verse 8, what were they actually doing in light of what God commanded? When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor? Imagine I invited you over to my house. I said, oh man, I want to get to know you better. I just love how faithful you've been, uh, the way you've served our church. I could tell you love the Lord and love the community. And I really respect you. So I want you to come over as a token of appreciation and a gesture of just how much I love you. So you come on over and you're thinking, oh wow, Pastor Shane, he must have prepared something nice, right? It sounds very like he wants to really make me feel special. And as you come, I bring out a plate of like clearly recently expired like leftover steak, Right? But, you know, it's like one of those, like, you know, when steak is poor quality, it's like gray, like that weird brown it turns. There's like zero marbling. I bring that up. But like the way I'm talking is very, very, I'm talking it up. Right? I'm like, hey, I really made this for you. You know, I want you to feel special. Uh, it's definitely edible, right? Um, yeah, Costco recently had this sale. They had this like really like five pack of meat that was almost expired. So I bought a bunch. It was discounted. And in fact, that's why I invited you over because I, I can't eat it all. You know, I got to get rid of it. So that's why you're here, right? And, and, and as you see me pull it from the fridge, you see in the fridge there is that special blue-coated prime ribeye just sitting in the fridge as I close the door and I bring you this leftover. 
How do you feel? How would you feel? I remember I went to meet my wife Angela's parents to formally ask them if I could marry Angela. Just the best I possibly could. But more importantly, I spent a good 30 minutes to get the best box of fruit that H Mart had to offer. Now, if you know our culture, for whatever reason, and by our, I mean like maybe just Korean culture, maybe Asian culture by extension, for whatever reason, like the golden ticket to a parent's heart is like fruit, right? Yeah, the best fruit. So I remember searching. I did one of those, like I grabbed, you know, pear from here, pear from here. I did the best I possibly could to do this because it is my gesture of I am giving you the best that I have because I think your daughter is worthy of that. Now imagine I went over, they opened their fruit box and the fruit's rotten. How would they feel? How do you think they would feel? And yet, God's people were knowingly offering up blind, sick, lame, handicapped animals to God, thinking that God would be pleased with that and that he would accept it. Like, just think about how wrong that is. That's literally what he's saying, like, God is saying, like, am I crazy for saying, like, this is wrong, what you're doing? And here's what it literally says. Here's a human example. Like, try giving that to your governor. Like, how human is that argument? Like, would your governor accept that and be pleased by that? And the reason he's giving the illustration is because nobody does that on a human level. If you esteem someone of even the slightest value, you wouldn't give them rotten food. And yet he's saying, but you do that to me. You do that to me. Now, this is where I mentioned last week, um, our culture, we kind of ooze an air of entitlement in life and it bleeds into our faith. And I, I mentioned, I asserted, like, I think it shows up in the way that we inadvertently treat God. And so to use a modern equivalent, what this might look like, because obviously we don't have animal sacrifice today. I think it's the equivalent of someone when you come to church half-heartedly, your heart's not here. You really are just here out of token, you know, religiosity. Uh, you have zero preparation of your heart to meet, meet the Lord, right? Meet the living God. Uh, you're counting down the, the minutes until worship's over and the sermon's over, which some of you guys are doing now. Uh, you check your phones during praise, right? You could care less about praise. You don't want to sing to the Lord. And then at the end of it, you think, but I have done God a favor, like, I'm here, aren't I? Like, God should be pleased because at least I still worshiped him. And God is saying, like, what? <laughs> like, how does that make any sense? Let me ask, have you ever felt more connected with someone in conversation and relationship when, when you meet with them? They don't look at you. They clearly don't want to be there. They're on their phone the entire time. And again, this is not just a one, two time thing, but like for 10, 20 meetings you have, this has become the normative culture of your relationship, which was the case for Israel. This was not a one, two time thing. This was the normative culture of temple worship. That's why God says a pretty harsh statement that I think any of us would say if we've had the 10th meeting with someone who does not want to be there. Look at verse 10. He says, I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you. This is a very strong statement, but it makes a lot of sense if you're the one receiving this kind of, you know, uh, relationship. God is saying, Buena Park High School, if people are here week after week and they don't even want to be there and they'd rather be somewhere else, just shut the doors. That's what he's saying. Like, don't waste your time and money. Like, why? In the same way that if I'm meeting with someone 10 weeks in a row and on the 10th time, they're not even looking at me. They don't want to talk to me. They're there out of some sort of weird obligation. I think I would say like, dude, you don't have to meet with me. Like, let's just stop meeting. It's better to not meet. That's what God is saying. Now, it's important to know the issue was not just the animals, right? It's not like God is like this, like, I only want the pasture-raised, grass-fed type of, you know, animal because I really need these animals. Of course, that's not the case. The issue was always a matter of the heart, and that was what was reflected in the way they were giving their sacrifice. That's why look at verse 13. There's an interesting detail. He brings out not just the diseased and the defective animals, but he says, you bring stolen animals as an offering. In other words, the point of the offering was that it symbolized the sacrificial act of giving your best at a cost to yourself to highlight God's worth and value to you. We all understand this intrinsically. Like imagine for Valentine's Day, 
My wife Angela comes home after a long day, and there's this beautiful five-course meal laid out for her on the dining table for her to enjoy. And on this big heart balloon, it says, Happy Valentine's Day, my love, right? It doesn't say Angela, it just says my love, so it could be anyone, right? But she comes home, and she comes in, and she says, and I say, you know, take a seat. Enjoy this delicious food. And imagine she's thinking and asking, oh, man, how special. Like, my husband took time to prepare all this food for me. And I say, oh, no, 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 I didn't prepare anything. My friend made all of this for his girlfriend, but they just broke up. So he said, hey, just take the food. So I was like, great, I don't have to do anything. And I gave it to you. Doesn't that, some, some, something changes in that moment, doesn't it? It's not just about the quality. It's great quality. It's still from me, but it cost me nothing. And I don't think any spouse would feel very valued if that's the case. Israel was offering God stolen animals. Could you imagine, hey, I got you an iPhone for Christmas. Oh, thank you so much. By the way, uh, it's stolen. <laughs> don't tell anyone. I didn't pay anything for it. Hope you don't get caught. God wasn't offended because he needs quality animals, ultimately. It's a deeper issue of the heart. It's always been. It always will be. When we give God what's broken, useless, and left over, you are communicating what you think he is worth. A.W. Tozer, he has a quote about this. I think it's so telling of our current day and age. He says, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. Most middle-class Americans tend to worship their work, to work at their play, and to play at their worship. As a result, their meanings and values are distorted. How telling that is of some of us in our culture. Now, before I move to the final point of a couple applications practically, I did want to share, because I think it's relevant to explain Why did these animal sacrifices have to be so spotless? Like, why did God care so much about the nature and the health of the animals that were being offered up? Again, it could be a whole sermon itself, but the reason the state of the animals mattered so much was because the entire sacrificial system that God instituted, it was meant to symbolize and point to a greater reality in Christ. Okay, that's what was going on. In other words, here's what I mean. Every time God's people offered up an animal sacrifice, it wasn't just about the act in that moment. It was reflecting and represented of eventually the gospel message of an unblemished, spotless lamb of God who would be sacrificed. So God cared that that symbol and that message was preserved appropriately, right? 1 Peter 1 verse 18 to 19 says very clearly, You were redeemed from your empty way of life, not with perishable things, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. In other words, we need to understand there is a dimension of our worship that is not even about you. It's about reflecting the message and glory of God. And the way that you worship appropriately or inappropriately sends either a proper message or an inaccurate message. In other words, this worship that Israelite was giving, it was supposed to talk about the lamb that was going to be slain that was without blemish. But if they're offering up sick, handicapped, diseased animals and the watching world's looking at Israel and be like, oh, I guess their God's cool with just like second leftover, second tier stuff. Does that really speak to the worthiness of the God of Israel? Now, obviously for us today is the application, therefore, like go find an unblemished lamb and sacrifice. Please don't do that. That is not the application. We don't do animal sacrifices anymore, but I would say the standard is even higher. Because Romans 12, Apostle Paul says, we are now living sacrifices. And literally it says we offer ourselves up as acceptable sacrifices. Are we living in that manner? The way we treat God, the way we approach God, the way we worship God, all matters because not only for our relationship with him, but our lives display a message of who God is and the extent of what he has done for us. And so can I ask you then, what kind of message has your approach to God, to worship, to godly living been these days, to your family, to your children, to your relatives, to your neighbors, to your coworkers? If somebody looked at your life and the way that you worship, not only Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, would they say, the God that this guy claims to worship is worthy? is glorious, is priority. And if not, why not? One, one thing I love about a church is we attract a lot of uh, non-Christians or people who are seeking or open and want to know more. And one of the brothers, um, 
one thing that I really appreciate about this brother is he's very serious. He doesn't want to just do the token Christianity, even though he understands and he grew up in the church. But he's like, man, if I really am going to confess to believe in Jesus, the ramifications of how that should transform my life are monumental. So I want to be very sure, like I'm serious about this. So he asks a lot of good questions. He really digs into it. And one of the things he brought up that I thought was so rebuking, he's like, but you know what's so discouraging is like, I seem to care a lot more about God than Christians do. He's talking about Grace Hill too. He's like, when I come to Grace Hill, it's so obvious nobody cares. Like, it's so clear. Like, it's just religiosity. Like, they all, they all sing and they profess, but look at their lives. Like, it's very clear nobody actually cares in a way that will influence their life. So he's like, I'm looking for somebody who actually cares because that's what I'm looking for. And that's where I was so rebuked because, oh man, we're so individualistic. We think the worship we give, the sacrifice that we embody, it's just about us and how we feel. No, no, no. Your neighbors are watching, your children are watching, and everyone who comes on a Sunday, they're watching. So what does it look like then to do that practically? How should we worship God rightly? Now, again, obviously we don't sacrifice animals. I would say there's four things we generally universally sacrifice for anything that we deem worthy, whether it's religious in nature or not, whether it's your work, whether it's a relationship. And of those four things, I would, I'll list them first. I think they're our time. Right? We're going to give and sacrifice our time and offer it, our money, our worship, and our service. Now, of those four, I'm only going to touch on two. I'm going to touch on time and worship. Money, we're going to talk about later because Malachi talks about it later. Okay? So that's coming. So time and money, how do we practically offer up acceptable sacrifice when it comes to our time and money? So first, time. Uh, for many of us, time is a seemingly depleting valuable resource, isn't it, right? The older you get, the less time you seem to have. Uh, it's, and it's so easy, and I include myself in this category, to justify our lack of intentionality with God by saying, I just don't have enough time. And I, I don't fault anyone for viscerally feeling that. I feel that every single day. I don't have enough time. Or when, when I have more time later, which is obviously the greatest lie, because all the older people I meet, they all say like, you have less time, less time, less time, less time, and then you meet the Lord, right? That's just life right? I remember a mentor of mine used to always tell me when I was like this young buck and always complaining, oh, I don't have time. I'm so busy. He would look at me in the eye and say, Sam, the president of the United States lives the same 24-hour day as you. He does not have more time than you. The godliest saints of old, they did not have 36 hours, so they had extra time to play with, to give to God. Everyone is constrained by the same amount of time. So is it really an issue that you do not have time? Or as we should all know, is it an issue of intentionality and priority? The answer is obvious. Now, let's state the obvious. We all agree, I think, time is an invaluable currency for relationship. Show me a relationship that doesn't spend any time together, I'll show you a distant, unhealthy relationship. It's literally impossible for a relationship to be intimate and vibrant if time is not a valuable component of that relationship. And one practical thing I would encourage all of us to do, as cliche or not, is Christian or even non-Christian, Take an honest look at how you spend your time on an average week. And let me caveat, not how you want to spend it. Because when I start the week, man, my schedule is beautiful, right? Work out, eat healthy, spend time with the kids, sleep eight hours. And then by Friday, it's like, I don't know what that schedule is. That's not what really happened. So not what you want it to be, not this idealistic time schedule, but really where do you spend your time? And as you honestly assess that, ask yourself, what does my time reflect about my values? Like, does it really reflect that I love and prioritize Jesus? Because your schedule is objective. Somebody can look at it, regardless of what you profess or what you say, or what you say I believe, your schedule says a lot. Now, to maintain the tone of the text, God is not even asking for some of your time if you have any left, right? Right? He's not saying, please, as you schedule, can you carve out some time for me? I'd be really great. You know, I know you're tired. But what does God say? He asks for the best. The best. And believe me when I say, I know how difficult this might seem. Like for a parent who is tired, God isn't saying, you know, I get it. I give you a pass. Parenting's hard. If you have some energy and time left after you've taken care of everything, could you offer that to me? You know, I hate to put it this way, but objectively, that's leftover time. That's what it is. And God is saying, on the contrary, when are you most alert? When are you most engaged? 
Like if you have an important meeting or an important engagement that you got to do, when do you usually put that in? When do you schedule that? In other words, when is the prime time for you? And God is saying, can you offer that up? Would that not speak of my worth? Now you might be wondering, okay, sure, I can do that. I can carve out 10 minutes of prime time. What do I do during that time? For parents, our education ministry made it easy for you. There's an Advent devotional. The instructions are so clear. It's literally for one time, for four weeks leading up to Christmas, talk about Advent-related things with your kids, take a cute picture, and how hard is that? And not only that, they are making it prosperity gospel by saying, we'll give you money to do that. How crazy is that? And if, that, if God is not enough, $20 Target gift card, if I have three kids, that's $60, right? Like, I'm torn. I'm like, oh, man. But as a parent myself, I'm like, that makes me want to do it, right? So I'm a sinner too. But what I'm saying here is, our church makes it easy. Or if you're like, man, what do I do with the time? What's a clear way to spend time with the Lord? In his word. I don't know where to start. We have a Bible reading plan. It's like a couple verses. At most, uh, five minutes of your time to read and spend time with the Lord. In other words, our church does our best to make it easy. So I don't think it's because we don't know what to do. It's our time. And secondly, worship. I know this is a broad idea in terms. So I'm going to specifically confine it to the corporate Sunday worship gathering that we are in now. Uh, I'm just very honest and sober because I know our situation for our people. It doesn't apply to everyone, but for some of us who call ourselves Christian, the one hour, 30 minute window from 11 to 1230 is literally the only time we come before God. Now, ideally that shouldn't be the case, but I'm just speaking honestly because I know that is the case for some people. And so I'm not even saying you should add more time to that. I'm saying if that really is the case, that of the seven-day week out of the 24 hours every day, one hour, 30 minutes of the seven-day week is the time you're going to spend with God, at least that time should it not be more of our top priority to approach it intentionally. That's what I'm saying. This is where the old school Christians would say, Sunday worship begins Saturday night. Now that might seem legalistic or like, whoa, that's so old school. But let me ask you, if you have a, something very important the next day, don't you rearrange things to really prioritize that time? You're meeting a significant other. You have a fun vacation plan. You have a flight to catch. Don't you rearrange things because that's important. That's what's going on here. Like I said, God is after your heart. If the question is, are you preparing your heart to meet the Lord on Sunday worship? This was so humbling for me as a pastor's kid myself, and I've seen the effects of what happens when you just profess Christianity, but your children don't see it. Parents, do you realize the week-to-week culture and mentality and posture and approach you model regarding meeting the Lord on Sunday that you portray to your kids? It's going to be how your kids come to understand what it means to honor God. It's just inevitable. And I'm not saying I'm better. I'm probably the worst at this. But I'm saying let's not lose that standard. Let's not be confused when God says, can you honor me in this way? And say, what are you talking about? Let's pray for help. Let's help each other. For young adults, do you place the same level of preparation and intentionality when coming to meet the Lord of Armies as you would with a work boss? Or a close friend. Now, I know this is an uncomfortable topic because Orange County Sunday worship culture is literally defined by convenience and not sacrifice. You know what the telltale issue that every single church in Orange County, like we've just decided to lose this battle, is this. People come late all the time. <laughs> like, if a pastor, if you try to fight that, you'll get fired because it's like, hey, bro, like you don't impede on us. Not only that, uh, if people miss, they don't feel anything. It's like, okay, I missed. Uh, not everybody, some, some people think it's funny that they don't remember a single sentence from the word that was just preached minutes after they hear it. Hey, what do you think of that message? I actually don't remember it. <laughs> That's so funny, man. And I, I, I'm guilty because I laugh too as the one who preached it. I'm like, oh man, you're right. You know, it's so hard to remember sermons. Is it really that hard to remember <laughs> I preached five minutes ago. And again, I'm not saying this to guilt you. I'm saying this to point to the reality of, I think, is God not worthy of some consideration regarding these things? God through Malachi is offering a sober wake-up call and he's saying, 
would you treat just any other important figure or situation in this way? Very reasonable argument. And if not, why me? Why me? Now, I want to close with a verse that's been on my heart regarding this. And we'll spend some quick time responding in prayer to however the Spirit might lead. But there, to, to give some context to the verse, there's a story of King David in the Old Testament. King David, obviously, man after God's own heart. And the story in 2 Samuel, there's a story where King David, he's looking for a place to kind of put the Ark of the Covenant. So that's kind of where God's presence resided. It was kind of mobile, and now he kind of wants to find the home for it. So he comes across a man named Arona, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, and he owns this piece of property that David thinks this is the perfect plot of land to put the Ark of the Covenant. So he approaches him, and Arona, knowing that this is not just any person, this is a king, says, you know what? You can have the land. In fact, I'll provide you all the materials necessary. I'll feed you. All expenses covered. Just take the land free of charge. Now, how many of you guys, if that was offered to you, would take that? I would take that in a heartbeat. But for David, this is not just some duty he's doing. This is his act of worship. So his response has been really sitting on my heart for a long time. Remember, as an act of worship, the king offers him the land free of charge. And what does he say in 2 Samuel 24, 24? The king answered Arana, No, I insist on buying it from you for a price. For I will not offer to the Lord, my God, burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Sounds a lot like I have a five-star meal I can give, but I don't want to offer my wife something that costs me nothing. Nothing. Does your relationship with Jesus cost you anything? Because can I remind you, as we learned last week, for Christ, it cost him everything. That's my prayer as a church, as I invite the praise team up, that we can grow in our desire to consider this, to be sober-minded and humble enough to admit when we are giving our leftovers, and to understand that God's honor, glory, and beauty is at stake in the way that we choose to worship him in the way that we choose to live. So if we're going to close this time in reflection and prayer, I'm just going to lead us in two prayer topics and I'll close. Uh, if I can first lead us in the first prayer topic to just consider a deeper understanding of how we've been treating and viewing God's worth in our lives and how that practically plays out in our lives. Again, I'm sure a lot of us, we've been taught and we may even know and believe that, yes, God is mighty, yes, God is majestic, but does that reflect in a very real way in our life. For some of us, that might be a time for humble repentance. Others, it may be asking God to grant us a more proper image and understanding of his worth. But whatever it might be, let's just take some time to reflect and respond, and I'll lead us one more topic.